All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Math 154. So this is week one, lecture two, the 12th, obviously. Uh, so we are going to give you your first two assignments today. Uh, today in class, as well as next class, we are going to do an introduction of Excel, a nice slow introduction of Excel, I hope. Remember that if you miss anything, you can go back and watch the replays on the YouTube videos that will be linked in Canvas, as well as built in my uh, playlist on YouTube uh, as the semester progresses. Uh, first of all, if this is your first day in class, if you just enrolled in the past 48 hours, please understand that you are responsible for going back and watching the lectures from last class. Uh, in that, you'll see that you have to enroll in my math lab. I had said by 5 p.m. yesterday, but since this is your first day, that means you have till 5 p.m. tomorrow. Please understand that you will be removed from this course if you don't do that. <clears throat> Um, and you'll find lots of useful information in Canvas, including an email that was sent to students uh, before day one that you have to read, and then some uh, other stuff like a uh, helpful tips file to teach you how to get Microsoft Office for free, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, all that stuff is explained last class. I'm not going to repeat myself. So the first two assignments that you have, and by the way, it's not really a great idea to try and get ahead in the homework in this course. I know a few of you emailed me and asked me some questions, uh, and I mean, that's cool. I like the uh, I like the motivation, but at least for now, for this first week, just kind of follow along with us. If once we're into the chapter one material, if then you want to start trying to get ahead, that's cool. That's fine. So the first thing that you will be assigned, the first thing that's due is a quiz. I had mentioned that there will probably be a syllabus slash course intro quiz. So this will be material based on information in your syllabus and material based on last class's lecture. So the syllabus doesn't hold every single answer. Uh, and then that's gonna be posted in Canvas. So maybe it's in that helpful tips file, the answers, maybe it's in the lecture I gave, maybe it's in the syllabus. It's five questions, it should be pretty easy. <clears throat> excuse me, and that is going to be due on January 19th, which is a week from today. I would normally have that due in just a few days, the 17th, but we do not have class on the 17th, and I don't really want to make anything due on a day we don't have class. Hold on a second. All right, <clears throat> so that is a Canvas style quiz, which means it will be graded automatically. Please understand that you have to pay attention and be careful with this. If you have a typo, I don't have to go back and give you partial credit for it. So if you have a misspelling, I don't have to go back and give partial credit for it. If you just type something incorrectly, I'm not going to go back and give you partial credit for it. So please be very, very, very careful. You only get one attempt and I will not extend that due date. The second thing that you'll be responsible for, which would be due the um, the following class five days later, that Monday, the 24th, is submitting the chapter zero spreadsheet and you'll be submitting that in Canvas as well. This is not a typical Excel homework. This is very atypical. What you'll be doing for this file is copying verbatim what we build in class over the next two classes. So you have to watch the lectures to build this. Now that's kind of a lie because I'm just going to be building what is in the chapter zero worksheet file. And it's also in the chapter zero text. So if you look at chapter zero, those three sections, we're going to ultimately build what is in the textbook. It's also listed in the guided activities, and then you'll see me do it over the next two classes. So once again, this is not a typical Excel file. Excel homeworks are going to be submitted and downloaded in the opposite order there, downloaded, then submitted in my math lab, and they will be pre-built Excel files that you just have to type a few answers and make a few charts in. This is us just getting used to Excel and doing something a little different. I'm not going to grade this for being, oh, they got nine of the 10 spots correct, or oh man, they, they didn't get this chart perfect. I'm gonna take points from them, no. This is a, you either get a 100 or you get a zero. There is nothing in between. If you do it, you get a hundred. If you don't do it, you get a zero. <clears throat> now, when I say if you do it, that doesn't mean type just three or four things and I'm gonna give you your hundred. You have to do the whole thing. So again, if a couple things are wrong, no big deal. Um, I don't even really care if all the numbers are exactly the same as what I have. I actually encourage you to try and use your own numbers. And you'll notice that the numbers from the textbook and the guided activity won't exactly match mine by the end necessarily. So it's not about the numbers. It's about getting the formulas and the formatting correct. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to talk about Excel quite a bit throughout the semester. We're going to have many homework uh, assignments in Excel. And Excel, for some people, 
is going to be tougher than for others. So what I suggest that you do is practice over and over and over with this stuff. We're going to learn how to fill formulas down and use fixed cell references. And if you see me do it once, <clears throat> sorry, tis the season. If you see me do it once, you're like, oh, I get it. But then a week later, you're going to forget it. So when you see me do something, do it yourself. And then do it again, and then do it five more times, and then do it 10 more times. Do it until your brain has this stuff memorized inside and out, because that's how you're going to become efficient and proficient with it. Another reminder is that you are responsible for reading ahead in the textbook. So you are supposed to read ahead one section in the text before each class. And I know most of my students don't want to do this, which is why sometimes I'll give pop quizzes on it. Now, I'm not saying that you need to spend two hours reading the next section. Just put your eyes on it, spend 10 minutes so you know what we're gonna be talking about. You'll see some of the charts ahead of time. You'll be familiar with everything. That's all I'm expecting, as well as the notes to share in Canvas, which I'm gonna start displaying maybe next class. And then down here, uh, just a reminder on how you save things on a computer for <laughs> all my uh, super young millennials or, or whatever the people that are 18 or their generations called um, who you know grew up with tablets. This button up here, this little floppy disk, this is an old way we used to save things uh, portably. So that's your save button. You can also hit file and then save, save as. So you'll be saving your Excel files doing that. So make sure you know how to save them, save them on your flash drive, on your PC. If you're at the library or something like that, make sure you're saving it on something of your own. And then I said that we will be assigning discussion boards <clears throat> uh, periodically throughout the semester. I'm not going to assign one for chapter zero. You'll hear me in uh, the lecture we're going to be doing soon say maybe I do, maybe I don't. Spoilers, I'm not going to assign it, but I do suggest that you complete it for your own records anyways, because there's going to be some good stuff for Excel that might help you to have it written down um, and you know go back to to reference a month from now, two months from now, a week from now, whatever. So again, I'm not going to have you turn in the chapter zero guided activities, but I do suggest that you complete it for your own records and you'll see me uh, do a lot of that anyways. Okay. So once again, I'm going to remind us what we're doing for the next two classes is building the chapter zero spreadsheet file that you will do yourself, save it, and then submit it to me in Canvas. I do have that spot to submit it open as well. Uh, I also have that quiz one available in Canvas for you to download. I'm sorry, not download, to complete. So your current assignments are just in Canvas. There's still nothing in the assignment section of my math lab that you need to be doing yet. I will always at the beginning of every class have a whiteboard like this and tell you exactly what is coming up for the next week's worth of assignments. So again, quizzes are either gonna be due the next class or within a week. Everything else is always due in one week. It just depends on the style quiz, whether I'm gonna do, have it due next class or one week. All right, so let's not waste any more time. As I mentioned, I'm going to do some things live in this course, some things I'm going to use pre recorded material. In these pre recorded materials, because I, I recorded a lot of it over a semester ago or two semesters ago, you may hear me say a date or you may see a date on the screen really quickly that I then try and cover up. Uh, if I have to, just ignore those. All dates for the course are going to be at the beginning and the end of each day's class. So if you see anything that says June, ignore it. If you see, ever hear me say anything about 2020 or 2021, ignore it. All right, so remember that if you have any questions, our mics are fixed on mute. You can ask them in the chat, which is on your Zoom menu. Again, I'm saying hi really, really quickly, just to show you where it is, but let's go ahead and get into this Excel stuff. All right, so the first thing I want to do is remind everyone how we get to the textbook, how we get to the workbook from the My Math Lab shell. So you go into your respective Math 154 course shell uh, for whatever class you have. And then to get to the e-textbook, you click e-text contents, which is also how we will get to the guided worksheets. Uh, we're going to be working on chapter zero stuff today. We're going to start with 0 0.1 and then over the next uh, this next full week of class, uh, we'll be covering all three sections of these. We'll be creating that Excel assignment, that chapter zero Excel assignment that you're supposed to be submitting to me in Canvas uh, by the due date provided. And yeah, so 
right here. Actually, let's do the worksheets first since it's a little shorter to open. So you go to the e-text, chapter zero, and then the guided worksheets are always at the bottom. Remember, this is how you can open or print these. You can also save them. That way, in case you did not buy the physical book or don't want to, you don't have to. And then when you open it up, it might take a minute to load. A little longer than normal. That's okay. And then here we go. So this is the guided worksheet, guided activity, whatever you want to call it, that you'll see me kind of referencing a couple of times today. And as I may or may have not have said so far, um, I don't always collect this, uh, but even if I don't collect the chapter zero one, you 100% absolutely positively should complete it because of the importance of some of these definitions some of these questions that you can then come back to, like about filling a formula down, what formula was in a specific cell, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how we get to our guided activities, which again, we will be uh, going through that entire chapter's worth. And then to get to the textbook, which you'll see me uh, follow a lot more today, you go to the specific section, and we're gonna start with 0 0.1, and then we hit explore, and then the textbook will open up. Now, sometimes it might not open the first time. I believe you may have seen me on the intro day that happened to me. So then you close it and try and open it again. Uh, occasionally, my math lab might be glitching and it is just not working. Uh, it could be your software or hardware. It could be a lot of things, but hopefully we get it resolved. Uh, sometimes the hyperlinks look appropriate. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they work appropriately. Sometimes they don't. I mean, when I say sometimes, I mean generally 95, 98% of the time they're working. So definitions. Um, you can find little videos and stuff. You go between the pages by using these tabs on the left and the right. If you know a specific page you want to go to, you can actually type it in this little screen here that is hidden by my Zoom menus. <laughs> um, there's little blips and bulletins and things like that for pointers that we'll be talking about. Anything with a little play button is a video that you can pull up and play. And some of these things are gonna be similar to what you'll see me talk about today. So obviously we're not gonna watch those. <clears throat> so again, that's how you can get to your textbook. And uh, you can just go from section to section. To get to 0 0.2, I don't have to back close the book, go back to the main My Math I page. I can just keep scrolling and there we go, 0 0.2. I can keep scrolling and eventually I'll get to 0 0.3. All right. So, okay, so Excel, Excel. The reason it's called Excel is because it uses cells and it's excellent, right? We can Excel <laughs> with cells. So when you open Excel, if you're using Excel and not any of those other programs I mentioned that you're not supposed to be using, if you're using the downloaded version of Excel and not the online version, which I said you're not supposed to be using because all of those other things have problems and will cause you to lose points on assignments, I guarantee it. This is what Excel will most likely look like. And you may have a couple subtle detail differences based on what version you're on. Um, I think I'm on like the next to most recent version personally. And if you downloaded it, you should be on the most recent, but don't hold me to that. And it might not be anything that, that looks different here, but it's just a sub menu, might have another option or two. And my computer is chugging really badly right now, so this might be fun. Uh, hopefully no issues, again, knock on wood, I should have insulted technology earlier, right? So you can zoom in and out on this. If you, you, if you have a scroll wheel on your mouse, Scrolling up and down takes you to lower cells. You can see the numbers getting higher and higher because I'm scrolling down more and more. If you hold control down, which is on most of your keyboards, the bottom left button, you can actually zoom in and out when it wants to work. There we go. Uh, no, don't look at that. So I tried to open that about 45 minutes ago and it literally just opened. <laughs> um, sorry about that. <clears throat> It was just emails, it's, it's nothing, you know, no private information or anything, but, so yeah, when your computer's working properly, ha ha ha, I'm holding control and scrolling on my mouse wheel to zoom in and out. Uh, there are other ways to do pretty much everything in Excel. Uh, if you go into view, that's probably where the zoom is, yep, so you can zoom in and out that way, but I just like using control, because it's a little quicker for me.
So you'll see these letters across the top, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, et cetera. And if you go far enough right, you'll actually get to letters like A, 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 B, A, C, A, D. So it's not like there's just limited to 26, and these are called columns. So each of these letters, this is a column. So this is the U column. This is the Z column. Z column being the 26th column, the Y column being the 25th column, A column being the first column. Columns are up and down. Think about when you look at one of those fancy buildings with columns on them, whether it's a library, a house, or whatever. Columns are vertical, so that's why our columns are vertical in Excel. Again, columns are vertical. When I'm doing this, this is me highlighting cells. I'm just clicking a cell with my left mouse button and I'm dragging around. I can highlight an entire column or part of a column. I can highlight a section of a row. So if columns are vertical, rows are horizontal and labeled by numbers. I can label several columns in several ro rows. I said label, I meant to say highlight. Now when you highlight cells, then you can do other things with them, but let's, uh, let's not get into that yet. So textbook. Again, what our goal is to ultimately do is to build the spreadsheet that you'll see in this textbook and in the guided worksheets. There are nice little notes here. When you open Excel, it gives you a blank workbook. Note that it says book one dash Excel at the top. You can think of a workbook as a three ring binder that contains worksheets and you can have other tabs. So note that there is on the bottom, there's a sheet tab, double click it to rename it. So let's go back to Excel, <clears throat> it's just sheet one. If I double click it, I can name it whatever I like. And I believe the name we wanna give it is sales order, order. <laughs> and then you can hit enter and there you go. So now it's just got a more specific name, kind of like tabs on a web browser generally have the website's name or something along the lines. Instead of just saying book one, well, what's book one? It's gonna be a sales order form. So they also say you can move to a different worksheet by clicking on the sheet tab. So just like you can make new tabs in a web browser, if I hit this button, I would have another tab and I can go to another website. As you can see, I'm a fan of multiple tabs. This is all my work stuff, my YouTube uploads, my Google Drive, got to go through 50 different things to open up <laughs> Zoom and my math lab and your course it's set in Canvas. <clears throat> So if we hit the plus symbol next to that, you get a new tab. So it's, you know, for Chrome, this is in the top right section generally. For Excel, it's bottom left. Sorry about my floating <clears throat> uh, start menu at the bottom. <clears throat> so now we've got another sheet. And I can make another and another and another and another, but I'm not going to. Um, so now if I type something here, just type a five in cell D, six, so cells are labeled based on the column then the number, sorry, the column then the row or the letter and then the number. <clears throat> so if I just have a five there, if I go to sheet two, it's not there. Also, I've zoomed in a little on this sheet, but this is the default size. So everything, oops, go away. <laughs> sorry, my little, my video uh, menu popped up. <clears throat> Uh, where was I? I got distracted? So again, everything blah blah blah. That's not going to be in the other one. If I zoom in super close on this one, the other one is still zoomed out as it was. All right. The undo button is my favorite friend. So let's say I typed in a 56 here. I hit enter and I go, oh no, I wasn't supposed to type that. Sure, I can just go back to it and delete it. But if you're dealing with Excel formulas, sometimes it'll act a little wonky and you can't just do it super easy. You might be making another mistake. So this right here is your undo button. This is my best friend. And if you hover over it, it'll probably tell you what the last thing it's gonna undo. Undo typing 56 in cell D3. Also, you can see that it says you can use control and Z to undo something. So this is me hitting undo. And I might go, well, wait, no, I, it was fine. It was fine, so I can hit redo. And that's control Y as well. So now I'm not over that undo. I can hit control Z, undo, control Y, redo. 
and you can undo several steps. So I type a 45 here, a 69 here, a 111 here. I can undo, 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 undo. I believe there is an ultimate limit to how many times you can undo, but it's probably a very large number, and I don't know it off the top of my head, uh, but that's okay. Nobody says I have to. All right, next page. Across the top of the spreadsheet is the ribbon, which consists of menus or tabs whose names are given at the very top, things like file, home, insert page layout, formulas, data, review, view, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The figure below displays the home tab, which is where we'll be in a lot of the time. Uh, there's only a few tabs that we really need to use that much. Uh, it's mainly home, insert, maybe formulas if you really wanted to go that way and then charts uh, when you go to create a chart. So for now, note that the home menu is subdivided into groups, clipboard, font, alignment, number, style, cells, editing, et cetera, et cetera. Clicking on the little arrow next to a group name opens a dialog box and gives a full range of options beyond just the few shortcuts shown. So what's that talking about? It's saying, all right, here's all the different things in the ribbon. And these are the little drop down arrows it was mentioning. So right now, there's a paint bucket icon with highlighter yellow. So on this cell D3, if I click it, <laughs> like I said, it's my computer's chugging for some reason, and then it highlights it. I could, I could have several cells activated and highlighted, and I can paint them that way. If I hit the drop down menu though, I can select a whole bunch of different colors. Maybe I want that cell to be puke green. <laughs> Maybe I want it to be this weird tangerine orange color. Maybe I want it to be some baby blue color. So you can have that cell be baby blue. I could have this cell be the, be just like charcoal black. I could make these cells over here, uh, lime green kinda, you get the idea. You have all sorts of drop down menus for other things, like there's this cash symbol which formats things to currency, American currency, if you just click the dollar symbol. So like if I have a five here, that's just a five. It has no sense of you know, denomination, scale, whatever. Is it five feet? Is it five bowling balls? Is it five dollars? Well, if I hit this button, it makes it dollars. And it even puts it to two decimal places because naturally our money's dollars and cents. So 5.00. $5, zero cents. But maybe our currency isn't the American system. Maybe it's the uh, pound. So there we go, five pounds. Or maybe it's the euro. Or maybe it's the yen. And then there's even more options if you go in here, but I'm not going to show that. Maybe you needed this to be a percent instead. Now you might say, well, wait a second, you had a five typed. Why did it turn into 500%? because one is 100%. One is a decimal is 100%. So five is a decimal value is 500%. If I wanted it to display 5%, I'd have to type 0.05. Then I can I activate that cell, click the percent, and that'll make it 5%. You can change the amount of decimals that are displayed. So maybe even though this is a whole percent, maybe you just wanna see it written, oh, wrong one as 5.0% or 5.00% or you get the idea. You can make more decimals displayed or you can make less dis decimals displayed with these two buttons. And then there's just a, a drop down menu for a whole bunch of different options, whether you want to display percent, fraction, time, currency, some of these we've already talked about. Let's see how many times I can hit undo. That was a lot of times. See, it goes pretty far. Um, which, by the way, I had a memo I wanted to show here. I've talked about this, but I wanted to make sure you saw it written down. Cells are labeled by the column, then the row. I even wrote number there instead of row. Columns are labeled by the column, then the row, so it goes letter number. So cell A1 is the very top left. Cell B5 would be the second column in the fifth row. See, second column, 
fifth row. This would be cell B5. When you click on a random cell, you might say, oh, well, I've got to figure out where this is. And if I'm really far over, like over here, I got to trace this out. Well, actually, if you just look along the top, the column that it's in is kind of highlighted, not highlighted, but it's, what's the word I'm looking for? Emphasized, <laughs> it's shaded, and so is the row. So you can pretty easily see that that's cell T15, cell H9, cell I25. Use your eyes. Also, look right here, look right here. That shows you the cell reference just directly, F7. M6, E5, E13, P26. Every time I click somewhere else, watch this P26 change to A1 when I click right here, A1. Watch it change to K2. Watch it change to B7. So if you can't trace these back to their roots, you can see it directly labeled right here. All right, so they told us to change it to sales order form. We already did that. And again, when we say A1 or when we say B7 or we say F2 or whatever, those are what we call cell references. We're referencing the specific cell's location. So a cell reference is when we say A2 or B5 or G9 or Z150, whatever. All right, so at this point, uh, it's gonna be a little more difficult for me to keep going back and forth. So I wanna have my book on half the screen and Excel on the other half of the screen. And I can do it like this, boom, okay. Then the fun is trying to get the textbook to look proper. It's always a little of a challenge, but that's okay. Come on, I know you wanna work for me. I think that's good enough. All right, so uh, that was weird. That was supposed to be moving with that too. Doesn't matter, I'm not gonna mess with this and, and make it angry and waste time. So click in cell B2. We're gonna start building this file finally. So click in cell B2 and type the word item. Cell B2, I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit. And we're gonna type the word item. And if you look down here, I know it's not very large right now, um, but this is what we're ultimately trying to build, but we're gonna follow along the text to do so. So next, so then they tell us to hit enter. So notice when I type at item, item, and then this is me hitting enter, it goes down. If I hit type in the word item, and then hit the tab button, it goes right. So enter makes things go down, tab makes things go right. So that's the next memo I have little right here. Enter makes you go down in Excel, tab makes you go right. If you don't ever use that, that's okay. You can just use your mouse to select as, you, as you've already seen me do 10,000 times. Okay. So what else are we doing? We're just typing item and that's it. End of the day, no I'm kidding. Next we're gonna type in the items that you sell which are soda, water, popcorn, cookie, hot dog. So they're saying for us to type those below items. So we typed an item, we hit enter and it put us here. So then we type soda, enter, water, enter, popcorn, enter. Sorry if my keyboard's really loud, by the way. Cookie, enter, hot dog. Also, remember how I was talking about the control button can zoom in and out? Control can change a lot of features when you're using your mouse or keyboard. So when I hit enter, I go down, I'm gonna hold control down now and hit enter and lock, watch what happens. Uh, <laughs> that's weird, it's not working. Or is it tab? It's supposed to be. Okay, my computer's being goofy. It's supposed to go up or left when you use control. Uh, clearly my technology's having a, a mild, mildly bad day but it doesn't matter. No one really uses that to go left or up. <laughs> um, so you don't need to see it demonstrated. <laughs> ah, life's fun. Okay, so after we've made that column of items, what do they say to do? They say to go to cell C2. So we're in cell C2, and we're gonna type in quantity, 
and then we're going to hit tab to go right. So tab to go right. I'm sorry, it's not control, it's shift. That's, that's what it was. So this is one of the instances where shift actually does it. So if I'm down here, if I hit shift and enter, that was my boo-boo. I'm just used to control doing everything. If you hold shift and enter, it goes up. If you hold shift and tab, it goes left. There we go. All right, so we're on quantity. We hit tab to go right. Then they say to type in uh, cost per item. Then they say to go right and type in cost. So we were here in the textbook. That's how far we've made it. Now, if you look very carefully, and again, I can't zoom in, uh, unfortunately. So hopefully, <laughs> Uh, you can either see that, see at least see that, look where it says cost per item right here. You can actually see all of the cost per item. Look on what I have though, it says cost per it. So how do I make it display? Because before I typed cost, it says cost per item, but then there's this like blank space because it's kind of overrunning into the next cell. It's not actually in the cell, it's just visually displayed over it. But when you type something in this cell, it says, well, I got to show that. That takes priority. So check it, check this out. This is really helpful. If you take your mouse and you put it on the line between two columns, so this line splitting the C and D, and I don't mean down here, not here. It has to be between the letters. In fact, watch my mouse change. See how it looks like this thick white plus sign? We're going to talk about this uh, shortly. Uh, but it looks like a thick white plus sign pretty much everywhere except here and here, which is very important. But so if I'm just here, this is not demonstrating that I can widen the columns. But when I put it over here, it's now this thin vertical black line with two arrows pointing left and right. That's demonstrating that we can widen the columns. So if I do it with this one, that's not really helpful because that's widening or thinning, if you will, the quantity section. So we need to do this one between D and E. Let's make it a little wider. Boom, now we can see cost per item, much nicer. Now we're ready to enter prices. Uh, admittedly, the textbook and the workbook, I think there's one price that doesn't agree. Let's just go with what we see on my screen currently though. Uh, we can change it later if we feel necessary. If we feel it's necessary. Okay, so. In cell D3, type in a one, so D3. So we're typing the cost per single item of these five different things we can purchase. So a soda is $1, so we're gonna type one, enter. Then they say, say in cell D4, type 1.25, so water is a buck 25. That's kind of annoying to me that water costs more than a soda, but I mean, what are you gonna do? Not the point of the problem, right? Uh, and in fact, what I have on my guided activities is that sodas are $2.50 and waters are buck seventy-five. But let's just do what we see for now. Then they say to type in the rest of the prices here of 1.5, so a buck fifty for popcorn. 0.5. Now watch this. If I just type 0.5, I don't actually have to type the zero. Excel will make it for me. And then two, and I think the hot dogs on my worksheet are 275. Again, don't worry about that particular, the difference in these values too much. It's not the point of the problem. Now, these are not displayed as prices though. These are actually prices and we really like things in Excel to be well displayed. That is one of the critical components throughout the semester to make sure they're well labeled. So how do we do that? We're going to change the format to currency. That's what this purple memo over here says that we already talked about. Now I'm gonna to have to maximize this again for you to see it. So if I'm on this cell, click the dollar and it makes it a dollar. And I could do this individually for all five of them. But imagine if you had 10,000 different items you were selling and you had to click these 10,000 times, you're gonna be super annoyed. So check this out. Remember I said you can highlight cells, you can highlight a whole different range of cells. You can highlight, I undo too many times. You can highlight all five of these, then hit the currency button. One and done, beautiful. So again, you can do them individually, 
or you can highlight those and just highlight these five because you can't, you can't guarantee that this is a cost. You can't guarantee that this is a cost or a dollar amount. Now the quantity is definitely not a dollar amount. The cost will be, but the Excel formulas we'll use will automatically make that happen as you'll see. So again, just highlight these five for now, which you know should be dollars and then make it a dollar. Okay, that worked, perfect. <laughs> I was a little scared that I was gonna have to flip through the book again. All right, so where are we? We were here. Press enter again so that you're in cell D9 or just click to get in cell D9. Click subtotal, sorry, type subtotal. So they want us here. So they want a blank space, subtotal. Why do they want a blank space? That was their decision. Doesn't have to be there, but it's fine. Hit enter. Next type in tax at 8%. And this is something that we're gonna change later uh, to make it a little more universal. But for now, let's just type tax, then the at symbol, which is shift and two, and then 8%. The percent symbol is shift and five. And then we'll type in total. So what does it look like the point of this is? We've got some store somewhere or a little pop-up restaurant at a concert venue or something like that where we're selling soda, water, popcorns, cookies, and hot dogs to people. And we're trying to figure out how many we sold in a day or a week or to one customer, something like that. And we're trying to keep a record of this. So we're gonna end up typing how many of these things we sell we wanna have a total cost of the things we sell of each of these. So for instance, if we sold five sodas at a dollar per, that would be a total cost before tax and everything of $5. But the thing is most states, 45 of the 50 states I believe, have sales tax. So this particular state is paying 8% sales tax. So you would have that calculated here after you have a subtotal, which is just adding up all these costs. And then this total would be adding up your subtotal and your tax. And if any of those concepts of how we get a subtotal or how we get tax are, uh, you know, they're rusty to you, those are things that you should know coming in here. Those are uh, arithmetic and very, very basic algebra concepts. But you'll see me write a couple quick formulas soon or you know, just scroll on the screen. <laughs> You're almost done. Not really. <laughs> you can finish with a quick formatting choice. Make the words in row two all bold by highlighting the cells B2 to E2. So we're gonna, we want these to be bolded. We want these specific cells to be bolded to give them a little visual flair. So we highlight them. We can do the one at a time if we really wanted, but I'm just gonna highlight them all. Again, I need to maximize this. And if you look up here, there's a B button, B for bold, or you can hit Control and B. So look, if I hit control B now, it unbolts. If I hit control B, bolt, unbolt, bolt. Or I can click, click. <clears throat> so again, that's just giving it a little visual flair. Um, sorry for the um there. I try not to um too much, but it happens. Okay, I think that's all the format stuff for that page. Moving on. All right. This right here, I'm gonna show you my abbreviated version of these notes in a second. Remember I talked about the mouse appearance when you're in Excel? Now, cause I don't have Excel activated, it just looks like regular mouse when I click over here. Most of the time, it looks like what we call a thick white plus sign, thick white plus sign. Come on, so we're here. So most of the time, it looks like a thick white plus sign. See that thick white plus sign. This is when, you're, when, you're, blah, when your mouse cursor looks like this, that's how you highlight or activate cells. So to activate a cell means that's the one you're typing in. So if I click here, anything I type or do is gonna be referencing cell B9. If I click here, it's, it would be used, uh, typing in cell E13. So when it looks like a thick white plus sign, you click to make that cell activate, activate and then type in it. Or you can click and drag to highlight cells. Now typing in that instance doesn't work the same. I generally don't recommend doing that. Highlighting is usually to, like we said, bold things, color them, move things as well. We'll talk about that in a second. So thick white plus sign. It looks like this almost everywhere. The only two places 
three places it doesn't really look like that is if you go between the letters or numbers See if you go between the numbers like this, you can make uh, them taller. If you go between the letters like this, you can make them wider or narrower. The only so that's one way it can look different. Another way it looks different is if you go around the green border of your active cell. So again, the green shows you your, what cell is active. Even when you highlight stuff, so now that all those cells are active. Notice that the mouse cursor looks different. When I go around this, it looks like a weather vane. Come on, highlight all of that please and thank you, there we go. So when I go around the green section of an active cell or active cells, it looks like a weather vane. That changes what your mouse does drastically. So if I just random, if I just keep highlighting things, I mean, I'm just clicking and dragging, clicking and dragging, clicking and dragging, clicking and dragging, but notice I'm always going to another cell or I can click and drag the insides of a cell I'm already in. So I'm not really doing anything besides just highlighting. But if I, if I have some cells or a single cell, let's just highlight cookie. So this is now the active cell. If I click on the border of that cell with the exception of the very bottom right, notice that the change we'll talk about. If I now click there, instead of highlighting, so I'm not, I'm not highlighting a whole bunch of different things as I move my mouse cursor, I'm actually just moving that cell. So maybe you accidentally typed cookie here at the beginning for some random reason, and you go, oh, that was supposed to be over here. Instead of deleting it and typing it, you can just make it the active cell. So again, I can't just do that. You have to click it first to make it active. So the green border's around it. Then you put your mouse over anywhere on the border except the bottom right, click, hold, and you can move it. I can highlight a bunch of them and click them and move them. I can move all of this stuff. Highlight, then move. Practice this stuff, practice this stuff, practice this stuff. I can't say it enough, you have to practice. Okay, well, what's up with when you have an active cell, the bottom right, little, little dot there, why is that dot there? That's what we call the fill handle. So that's called the fill handle. So when you have an active cell, if you put your mouse cursor over that tiny little spot, it becomes a thin black plus sign. So when you're over the fill handle, and I'll have that typed up shortly, <laughs> it becomes a thin black plus sign. So if you highlight that, you can't, I'm sorry, if you click and drag, you can only go down or right initially you can actually do an entire region if you have a row or column highlighted. So when I did that, all the things I had typed over here just disappeared. Let me undo and show you what I did again. So I'm taking this cell, which is blank. I'm putting my mouse over the fill handle. I'm clicking and I'm dragging. I'm gonna drag over just to where it says subtotal and watch what happens when I let go of my mouse. Click. It disappeared. What happened here? So there's nothing in this cell. By grabbing the fill handle and moving it somewhere else, I'm telling Excel that I want the rest of the cells to be blank because this one's blank, I want the rest to be blank. That's not something we usually do, but it works. So let me undo that. Check this out. Let me just type the number seven right here. Random number seven, hit enter. Go back and highlight the cell, activate the cell, that is. Grab the fill handle and drag it down. Drag it down more. And look, it even says seven right there. So it's just gonna make all those cells say seven because that's what that cell said. This cell says hot dog. Let me activate the cell, grab the fill handle, and then I got more hot dogs. <laughs> so that's what the fill handle does. It, it copy pastes things when you just have a number or a word, kind of. But we generally use it for Excel formulas. Now, remember when I had the seven there and I grabbed the fill handle and I filled it down, it just says sevens. Check this out though. Control, remember I said control very often changes how things work. If I grab the fill handle, hit and hold control, and even look very carefully, you might notice the top right of my cursor has an extra little plus sign. Look just above where my mouse is, little plus sign, now it's gone. 
I'm holding control, I'm letting go. I'm holding control, I'm letting go. So when I drag this time and I hold control, when I let go, it actually increments the numbers. That's really helpful for dates. That's really helpful if you need to write the numbers, say one through 10,000, because you could just write the number one. Get rid of all these. And then I could drag it down, 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 down hold control. And now I just type the numbers one through 320 without even lifting a finger practically. I mean, I, I had to lift my finger off control, but that was the only thing I really had to do. So control changes how the fill works. Changes how a lot of things work. All right. So thick white plus sign is how you activate a cell or highlight cells. A weather vane is when you're over an active cell and that's how you move cells. The thin black plus sign is when you're over the fill handle of an active cell and that's how you fill in formulas, which is our entire purpose of Excel, is to fill formulas. These three lines right here. Remember how I just made the numbers one through almost 400 in the snap of a finger? That's the point of Excel, what we call batch processing. One of the many points of Excel, as well as what we call what if analysis, where we can just change things and change things and change things and see how they play out. So you got a job and your boss gives you 10,000 different sets of dimensions and he wants you to have a formula applied to those dimensions, whatever might be relevant to your job. And he says he wants it on his desk in an hour. And you go, I can't do 10,000 equations in an hour. And then an hour later, you're fired. And it sucks, right? <laughs> well, if you had known how to use Excel, you could have said, Bob, Bob's your boss. Bob, I'll have that to you in three minutes. Because he, he's going to give you the spreadsheet with the dimensions, so you just type a formula once, you use the fill handle to apply it to all 10,000 times, and your day is done. You're not fired. You get a bonus. Batch processing. Very excellent. Okay. Let's continue. So now you can see we want to make some colors, put some colors to this, give it a little more visual flair. So we want to highlight the quantity cells. So that's where... Thick white plus sign, just click and drag. And then we're gonna make them a yellow color. Then we're gonna make these kind of a green as well as these three. So I gotta maximize that. So highlight those and we're gonna make them a yellow. It wasn't quite a highlighter yellow. So remember paint bucket icon, the little drop down menu to change the color. That's what I did. Again, highlight the five cells. Hit the drop down menu to select the color. Boom, done. Highlight these five cells, drop down menu, select the color. I uh, look more like that, I think. Boom. Highlight these three cells, same thing, but check it out. The paint bucket, it remembers the last thing you used as well as all the currencies, percents, all that stuff. So instead of doing the drop down menu and picking the green again, I can just hit this and it already does it for us. Notice that these yellow and green sections, they're only, they're a solid yellow and a solid green. If you look really carefully at this, there's like a border around them as well as borders between each cell. I don't see that here. So the next thing we wanna do is put borders in there. So let's show you how you can do that. Highlight the, the five cells, just those five again. This is your border option. Now, currently it's only on bottom border, so it only put a border on the bottom of that one cell. So let's undo. Let's do the drop down menu and you want the all borders option. And there you go, there are your borders. There's a lot of different options. Pick whatever's relevant, but it's usually all borders. I use all borders constantly in Excel. Do the same thing here. Now again, since it was the last thing we clicked, I don't have to do the drop down menu. Just click that. Highlight these three cells, click. That's it.
All right, now let's get into entering formulas. <clears throat> Again, the two main points of Excel for us are using formulas to make Excel do the math for us and batch processing. So if I have, let's say I sold, this is me not looking at the book, I sold seven sodas, I know that the total cost was $7. And I, I could go in and format it as currency, but I'm not worried about that for now. But if I sold five sodas, I gotta go and do the math and say, oh, right, well, five times one is five, so that's $5. Or if I sold 100 sodas, that would be $100. I keep having to type numbers in both. I don't wanna have to do that. I want Excel to do half of that for me. I just wanna type the number in the soda here, I sold five sodas, and then I want Excel to tell me the cost without me doing any math personally. So that's where this stuff comes in. So we're gonna use a formula. How do you find the total cost of sodas? It's the number of sodas you buy, or someone else bought, times the cost per soda, the cost per item. This is a very general formula that we'll be using all semester long. We got a lot of very basic formulas that we'll be introducing over the next week and a half that will be used all semester long that you're never allowed to forget and they would not be on any kind of formula sheet for you. It's just quantity, the number of them times the cost per item. So you take the number of sodas times the cost per soda, the number of waters times the cost per water. You're just multiplying these two numbers. So if I had two waters, I'd take two times 1.25 and it'd be 2.5. But again, I don't wanna do the math. I want Excel to do it for me. So how do we make formulas in Excel? How do we make Excel do the math? You have to start out with an equal symbol. Excel formulas start with an equal sign. So if you want Excel to do calculations for you, the very first thing you type in a cell is equals. And then the blah, blah, blah is just whatever the formula would be. Now with the equals, we're going to be using cell references. I'm not in this cell. Let's say we sold, let me find out how many it's gonna be. <clears throat> Come on, one. All right, so we're gonna end up selling one soda that day, or maybe one soda, one customer. So in the cost, because I want Excel to do one times one, which would be one, I don't just type one times one. It leaves it as one times one. If I type four times seven, it leaves it as four times seven. But if I go equals four times seven, it's gonna do the calculation for me and tells me it's 28. Now, what I typed in is still in the what we call the formula bar. This is what I typed in. I typed equals four times seven. But watch what happens when I hit enter, it displays the actual answer. It doesn't display the formula. If you double click it, it will display what we typed as a formula and we can then even enter it now four times five. Why is my five not working? There we go. And it's 20. Or I can double click to edit it and say it's uh, four minus five, negative one. All right, so we have one soda and it's one dollar per soda, so that should be equals one times one, right? And we can see that we're spending one dollar on all our sodas, or they spent one dollar on all our sodas. But watch what happens if I change the quantity to five. The cost doesn't update, but that's what we have Excel for. We want to Excel to go ahead and automatically change it. So instead of typing equals one times one, we need to say, hey, Excel, take whatever is in this cell and multiply it by whatever is in this cell. We have to use cell references. So again, cells are things like A5, D4, Q3000. So this right here is cell C3. Sorry. So this right here is cell C3, C3, C3. This right here is cell D3, D3, D3. So we're gonna tell Excel to multiply those. So in the cost section, we type our equals. C3 
And look what happens when I type C3. C, nothing's happened yet, but push your eyes right here. Three, it puts a little blue box around it saying, hey, you mean this one? So if I did it wrong, if I type cell C5, I go, wait, nope, uh, that's not the right one. It's supposed to be cell C3. Okay, thank you, Excel. You're very helpful. Times, which is shift and eight, that's your multiplication symbol. And then we want cell D3. So I'm gonna type D, and watch this cell when I type three. Red border, you mean this one. So it's gonna tell us to multiply whatever's in these two boxes. And as I update numbers, it will update what the output is. An input is what goes in, which was the numbers in the blue and red boxes, and output is what comes out, which is what you'll see when I hit enter. And look at that. It knows because this was a currency, it should even format the answer as a currency, which is brilliant. So now if I type that we have sold five sodas, look at the cost, it's $5. If I sold 100 sodas, there's a cost of $100. If I sold somehow 3.5 sodas, that's a sales of $3.50 before tax. But it was one, so let's leave it at one. Okay. So that's what you can see them saying here. That cell, which was E3, now we didn't type the E3, we, we type this, equals C3 times D3. You don't have to type it though. Let me start from scratch, clear. Activate this cell. Watch what happens if I type C3 times D3. C3 times D3, and I hit enter. Oh no, it didn't work. What did I do wrong? That doesn't make sense. These are things that you should be saying to yourself. Why does it just say C3 times D3? Why doesn't it say $1? What did I forget? The equals. I can even just double click and quickly edit it. Oops. <laughs> I'm getting a little careless with my mouse. Put the equals in front, boom. Now it does the math. Check out what happens. All right, well, how much are we spending on water? Well, I don't know the quantity yet. First of all, if a cell is blank, Excel basically thinks of it as a zero. So if I do my formula here, now that should be C4 times D4, so I go equals C4 times D4. The blue and the red show me the boxes, and I go, yep, that's right. But because we didn't sell any waters, the cost is nothing. This little dash means nothing, zero. It's another way of displaying zero, or there wasn't enough information to do a calculation. I don't have to use typing, though. Check this, this is what I was about to say earlier. I can use my mouse. So I go equals, I do have to type the equals. Instead of typing cell C3, I can click it. You still get that blue border, but because you clicked it, it's, I don't know, I guess it just moves around it to really make sure, hey, are you sure? Now I still have to type my multiplication symbol, and then I can click this cell. Hey, you mean this one? Yes, and look, by using clicks instead of typing the C3 and D3, everything display perfectly. I hit enter, I get the same answer. For this one, I could do the same. I can type equals, click the cell, times, click the cell. And I could do that for all five of these if I wanted, but I'm not gonna, because what if there are 10,000 of them? I don't wanna do that 10,000 times. So here's the beauty of the fill handle. And I'm gonna go ahead and put some numbers over here. I wanna skip around just a touch. Let's get the numbers right. I don't know why the book does it this way. It's a little silly, but it's okay. One, two, three, four, five. That's changed. <laughs> it did not used to be one, two, three, four, five. But no matter, no matter. So one, two, three, four, five. So let's make Excel figure out what these formulas are supposed to be in these four boxes. That's where the fill handle comes in. <clears throat> So remember, this one was supposed to be C4 times D4. Activate the cell where you typed your formula. So make sure it's activated. Put your mouse over the fill handle so it looks like the thin black plus sign. Not the border, if I do this, I move it. I don't wanna move it. I wanna grab the fill handle, click. I'm still holding the click, left mouse button, and drag it down. Now you can drag it and apply it to a whole bunch of different spots or you can just do the next one. Let's just do the next one for now. I'm gonna let go. 
And look at that, two times a buck 25 is definitely 250. If I double click, or if I just look up here, you can see that Excel has used its computer brain and it said, well, since you drag this formula down a row, you probably want this formula to be applied to the numbers in the next row. And that's exactly what we wanted. So that's awesome. So I can hit enter. I can make this one active, grab the fill handle, drag down, and there we go. I get the next one. I can do it again and I can do it again. Or what I could do from the beginning is, when I just had the first one, I can click and hold the fill handle. I'm still holding, I'm still holding, I'm still holding, drag to all five spots, four the extra spots, whatever you wanna say, let go, and it applies the formula all at once. That's why I was saying, if, my, if, Bo, if Bob's boss or my boss, whatever the name situation was, <laughs> this is probably why my computer is stalling, because it needs to restart, it had an update. Um, sorry about that. <clears throat> So when I clicked and dragged, it applied the formula to all of those. If I did that to 10,000 different rows, I would have 10,000 different sets of data completed within a matter of less than a minute. And that's how you go to your boss, Bob, and say, I'm done in three minutes, and you go home for the rest of the day. Versus your other buddy who's working hard for an hour and then gets fired. Okay. So again, have a formula typed. If you want to apply that to the next set of rows, you're gonna grab the fill handle and drag it down. There's gonna be times when we need to fill a formula to the right. Now, this is not gonna make any sense because we're not applying this a whole bunch of things. So just why there's all the dollar, don't worry about it. When you do it in a sensible way, you get sensible answers. You can double click on them to make sure that the cell is right. The blue and the red highlight the boxes and say, hey, you mean these two? Is that the ones we're supposed to multiply? Why, well, yes, indeedy, it is. You can hit enter to get out of that. Check this out. When I'm in an active formula, so I'm in the typing, if I click over here, or I click over here, sometimes it'll act a little goofy. And of course, it's not gonna do it to me right now. But that's okay. Let's let's act like it did something goofy. That's what the undo button is for. All right, we already talked about most of this stuff. Just a couple random definitions which you can write down in your guided worksheets. Uh, we talked about inputs and outputs already. Inputs are the numbers that are typed. Outputs are things that formulas uh, apply to. Variables are the, the quantities you give them, the, the specific inputs. Constants are things that don't change, like the 8% or the cost per item. And the cost per item, you could call that a parameter. I'm not gonna give you test questions on definitions. It's nice to know them, but you can survive in this course without knowing exactly what those mean, quite honestly. So we've already done all this stuff. We already talked about the filling the formulas I already showed you, but this is the textbook discussion of it as well. So if you need more, read that. Remember, you're supposed to be working on guided worksheets for this. So the guided worksheets, you see a lot of the same information here. These look about the same, don't they? We typed that in that box. Question one, which is right here. What formula is entered in cell E3? That was where we typed something in here, and that was the equal C3 times D3. How do you fill this formula down? Grab the fill handle and drag. <laughs> I'm not gonna answer all of those questions for you, but please complete those on your own. Um, as I said, we will be having discussion boards on those. Uh, I'm gonna think over the weekend how much of a discussion board I want for this one, but for now I'm leaving it open because of the quiz and I want you to be focusing on building this. But I still suggest answering, especially for this first chapter, every single question in this guided activity. Please, for your sake, even if I don't make it an assignment, do it for your sake. And that is the first section. All right. Uh, I think we have just enough time to uh, cover what we need to in the second section, just to fill out these last few details. Let's get the subtotal, the tax, and the total. A subtotal is just the sum of everything. You add up the five costs for soda, water, popcorn, cookie, and hot dog.
there's a built-in Excel function to do that. It's called sum. Now you could just go equals and add those five cells, uh, C5 plus D5 plus E5 plus F5 plus G5 or whatever they were. Or you could use the built-in Excel function called sum. Sum, so equals sum, you open a parentheses, you would type or click the first cell that you wanna add, then you, type a, or, uh, then you type a colon, then you type or click the last cell that you wanna add. Or you can drag, there's all different ways to do this. But this is the nomenclature for doing an Excel function. You type in equals, then a word or abbreviation, whatever it is, for what you're trying to do. Then the first and the last cell being used go in parentheses. And there's different Excel functions that are set up differently. That's the format for most of the ones we'll see. So in the subtotal box, this is where I want to add these five numbers. So I need to click it and type in equals, because I want Excel to add up the one, the 250, the 450, the two, and the 10, in case the next day the waters and popcorns and cookie quantities changes. So equals, sum. And when you start typing your function, it even says, hey, do you mean any of these? So you could do like a sum product. You could type product if that's what we were trying to do, which is not what we're trying to do. We're just trying to do a sum. Open a parentheses. Now I want to be adding these five cells, which are E3 through E7. I think I said letters and said earlier, that was just because I was trying to think uh, three different things at once. So sorry for that earlier flow. <clears throat> C, sorry, E3 through E7, so I type E3. The upper and lower case doesn't matter. So that says the first one, then a colon, now look, when I typed E3, it said, hey, you mean this one? Yes, I did, colon. Now let me type the last one, which is where the 10 is, and that's E7, so E7. And now it's actually gonna highlight all the ones that we're adding. So you mean to add all of these? Yes, I do, Excel, thank you. Close your parentheses, hit enter, and that answer should make sense. That is the sum of those five numbers. Now check this out. If I change the number of hot dogs to 10, when I hit enter, I haven't hit enter yet, the cost will change to $20 and the subtotal will change to $30. Boom. Wasn't that a lot easier than you doing all that yourself? If I change the popcorns to 17, whatever the math comes to, it'll change the total cost of popcorn and the subtotal. This is one of the many beauties of Excel. How do we calculate sales tax? Sales tax is the sales tax rate as a percent or decimal. Excel can actually use it as a percent. If you're doing classic math, you need it as a decimal though, times the cost of the items. Sorry, I don't want to display that. Next line yet. Here we go. Sales tax equals sales tax rate times cost of items. So we'll need an equals. Then we'll need to have the sales tax rate typed out since we don't have a cell for it. We'll change that later and then we'll multiply it by the cost of the items, which is the subtotal. So we're gonna type equals. The sales tax rate, which is the 8%, I can type 0 0.08, or since it's Excel, I can just leave it as 8%, because I don't have that in a cell somewhere. This cell does not say 8%, this is a label. Times, and then the tax is based on the subtotal, so we click or type the cell with the subtotal and hit enter. So we can see that our tax is $1.60 based on 8% sales tax. And then the total is just the sum of the subtotal and the tax. So I can just go equals. Now I could go sum open parentheses uh, and then E9 colon E10. That would work, 2160. But since it's just two things, I'd probably just go equals and then say click cell E9 plus cell E10. Same answer. So sum is just a, a quicker way to add a whole bunch of things. If it's just two or three, I'd, I'd just use the plus sign personally, but that's me. <clears throat> Going back to the subtotal, let me clear that. Instead of typing, typing everything, let's use the mouse sum. I still have to type equals, I still have to type sum, I still have to open a parentheses. But I can use my mouse and actually just click, hold, and drag, and highlight all the ones I wanna add. So I'm clicking and holding, and then I'm gonna drag, 
to highlight the five that I want to add and look at what happens. I just pointed at the screen like you can see me. <laughs> Silly me. Look at what happens in the sum formula. Watch, it says E3, E3 to E4, E3 to E5. As I highlight more cells, it changes them. Now the cool thing is when you use the mouse to do this, you don't actually have to type the end parentheses. I can just hit enter, but it's only when you're using the mouse, the keyboard you have here. Still get the $20, the tax is still correct, the total is still correct. There are five primary built-in functions that we will use throughout this course. Honestly, the last one, we don't really, but it's got its uses. Sum, average, max, min, and count. Please do not abbreviate average as AVG. You have to spell it out or it won't use it correctly. So let me say, I just wanted to know what's the average quantity of an item we sold. So in this random cell, I can type equals the word average, open a parentheses, highlight these five cells, hit enter. And it says the average quantity sold was three. So if you added one plus two plus three plus four plus five and divided by five, that would be the average. Da, 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 da. Okay, very last thing we're gonna do uh, with the last couple minutes we have. Yes, perfect. This is exactly where I wanted to end. Is I don't like, and the textbook ultimately doesn't like, that they fixed the tax rate at 8%. So I had to type 8% here. I would ra much rather that 8% be in a cell somewhere so I can use it as a cell reference. That way, if I wanna go to another state where the sales tax is only 5%, or go to a state where the sales tax is maybe 0%, like Oregon or uh, Alaska or the other three. I can't think of off the top of my head. Not that it matters. Delaware is one of them. Three out of five ain't bad. So if I want to change the state, I have to keep changing it here. So now we're in some state where it's 4%. But then I also have to change the label. So that's tedious. So let me undo. They want us to put the tax rate over in cell G9 and H9. Let's maximize. So over in cell G9, let's write tax rate. And then in H9, let's change this to a 5% state. And hit enter. Now where it says tax at 8%, let me erase that and change it to just tax. Or even more specifically, sales tax. I much prefer that phrasing, but that's me. Now it still says a buck 60, even though I said the tax rate's 5%. Why is that? You double click the formula, it says 8% in the formula. So you need to reference the cell where it says 5%, not the cell where it says tax rate, the cell where it says 5%. So instead of doing 8% times E9, let's leave the equals. We wanna take the tax rate cell, so I can just click it or type H9 times, and then click the subtotal or type it cell E9. And now our sales tax is only a dollar because we have a lower tax rate. If I change this cell back to, if I change it to 8%, look at that, our sales tax goes back to a buck 60. If I type this as 0%, it says there is no sales tax because we're in Oregon and happy on the West Coast. So it's just $20. If you have some outrageous sales tax of, maybe we're at a restaurant and it's 12% because that's typical, $2.40. So this is a much better setup because it gives us more parameters to play with. So I can say, all right, well, I saw, let's make this a little more realistic. I sold 100 popcorns this day. I sold 45 cookies this day. I sold, we had a great deal in hot dogs. So we sold 800 hot dogs. We sold uh, 450 sodas and we sold one water. Now I did this intentionally. Look at how some of these numbers now look like hashtag, hashtag, hashtag. That's because we're zoomed in too much or you can either zoom out by control and mouse wheel or using the zoom under uh, view. And sometimes even that zooming in or out might not be enough. See, some of those still aren't fixing. So when that doesn't work, you can widen your column. So take your mouse between E and F, just widen your column and boom, now you can actually see all the numbers. This is a little more realistic for a hot dog vendor at a concert place. <clears throat> Having 2,000, 2,500, whatever, worth of data. So that's time. That's all we have for today. Please, if you're working.
All right. So make sure that you save what you've done so far when you are doing this, whenever you do this, because when we come back next class, we're going to show you the second half. We're going to create a second tab in that file, and it's going to feel like we're starting fresh, but it's going to be very, very similar material type stuff. We're still going to be talking about the hot dog vendor and everything, but again, it will be a fresh tab. Building a new table, we're going to make some charts, and then you'll have to save that as well. So you're not going to make two files. It's all going to be in one file that you'll submit in Canvas. It's just one file. All right, so hopefully this was helpful and informative. Hopefully this will be a good video for you to use to practice. Again, remember that this, this thing that you just watched plus what you watch next time is what you're going to be submitting as your chapter zero spreadsheet in Canvas by the 24th. Don't forget to do your syllabus slash course intro quiz that's in Canvas. Remember to be very, very, very careful. You will only get one attempt and typos will not necessarily get you any kind of partial credit. This course is very, very heavy on the pay attention aspect. So please be careful and pay attention. As always, email me if you have any questions, either at rbecknertcc.edu or via the Canvas system. Uh, if you are a new student, make sure that you enroll in my math lab using the course ID provided in the syllabus and on the home screen of Canvas, where the uh, day one email is, where the title of that is. Uh, any students who don't enroll within you know, roughly 24 hours of the first day of class, you will be deleted for lack of participation because there's so much that's going to be going on in this course. All right, so have a great weekend. Remember that we will not be meeting on Monday. Monday is a holiday. So we will see each other uh, in a week. So that gives you lots and lots of time to get this stuff figured out by then, hopefully. All right, take care, everybody.